Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'd like to, as we begin our time of worship this morning, to read for you from Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when, that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. There are several who are standing with Jesus this morning in the baptistry. Let's turn our attention there. Kevin Roughgarden, who is Jesus to you? He is my Lord. Kevin, on your profession of faith in Jesus, it's with great joy I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, rise to walk in newness of life. Adrian Roughgarden, who is Jesus to you? He is my Lord. Adrian, on your profession of faith in Jesus, it's with great joy I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, rise to walk in newness of life. And Ava Simmons, who is Jesus to you? He's my Savior and my Lord. Ava, on your profession of faith in Jesus, it's with great joy I baptize you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, rise to walk in newness of life. As she swims out of the baptistry. <laughs> Lord, we've done as you've commanded us, and still there is room. Thank you. 
And now it's your turn to stand up. Would you take an opportunity to greet those around you? Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here.
And all God's people said, Amen. God has promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. In Christ, God revealed his faithfulness to us from the beginning of time. In Genesis, Jesus is the ram at Abraham's altar. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the high priest. In Numbers, he is the cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the city of our refuge. In Joshua, he is the scarlet thread out Rahab's window. In Judges, he is our judge. In Ruth, he is our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is our trusted prophet. And in Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he is our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of everything that is broken. And in Esther, he is the Mordecai sitting faithful at the gate. In Job, he is our redeemer that ever liveth. In Psalms, he is my shepherd, and I shall not want. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. And in the Song of Solomon, he is the beautiful bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the suffering servant. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, it is Jesus who is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the wonderful four-faced man. And in Daniel, he is the fourth man in the midst of a fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is my love that is forever faithful. In Joel, he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, our Savior. And in Jonah, he is the great foreign missionary who takes the word of God into all of the world. You go on and you see in Micah, he is the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is the avenger. In Habakkuk, he is the watchman who is ever praying for revival. In Zephaniah, he is the Lord, mighty to save. In Haggai, he is the restorer of our lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is our fountain. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. In Matthew, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. In Mark, he is the miracle worker. In Luke, he is the son of man. And in John, he is the door by which every one of us must enter. In Acts, he is the shining light that appears to Saul on the road to Damascus. In Romans, he's our justifier. In 1 Corinthians, our resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, our sin bearer. In Galatians, he redeems us from the law. In Ephesians, he is our unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he supplies our every need. And in Colossians, he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he is our soon coming king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he is the mediator between God and man. In Titus, he is our blessed hope. In Philemon, he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And in Hebrews, he is the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, it is the Lord who heals the sick. In 1st and 2nd Peter, he is the chief shepherd. In 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, it is Jesus who has the tenderness of love. In Jude, he is the Lord coming with 10,000 saints. And in Revelation, lift up your eyes, church, for your redemption draweth nigh. He is King of kings and Lord of lords.
Thank you, Mark Milroy and choir for reminding us that Jesus is on every page in our Bible. It's all about Jesus. He's the center of the book, and he wants to be the center of our lives. Thank you for being here today. We have a program. We are following it, so uh, relax and let God speak to you through the things that are sung and said in these moments that remain. There's an extra insert in your program today. Just take a moment today and look that over. There are two big dates coming up related to our capital campaign and our building renovation. The first one is next week. It's Information Sunday. And then in March, the Sunday when we see what God's going to do and what you're going to do in cooperation with God. So mark those dates and be a part of it. I'm glad you're here. And if you're a guest, please take a moment and fill out one of our communication cards. We'd love to know where you're from and how we can uh, pray for you. Let's ask God's blessing now. Our Father and our God, we are here this morning grateful for all that you are and all that you've done for us. Even this week, how you've shown yourself mighty in our lives. And we gather now to listen for your voice. If we hear your voice speak to us, we will obey. We'll go where you tell us to go. We'll do what you tell us to do. We pray our singing and our praying will be worthy of you and that you'll be honored in it all. Be with those who are far, far away today. Bring them home to us soon. Those who are sick, we ask for their healing. And those who grieve for your comfort. It's in the name of Christ that we lift our prayer. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue in worship?
attitude so often that we confess our need for the Lord in times of decision or great need or trial. It's also so often in the gathering of believers in the sanctuary of our God where we rehearse and sing and lift high the attributes of our God and the sacrifice of the Lord on the cross that we reflect on our need for his precious blood poured out for us. Listen as Courtney teaches us this new song and then sing with us.
Prison Encounter worship service tonight, uh, and you're invited to the FAC to that. It's also a Super Bowl party combination. And uh, if you don't have anywhere to be tonight, that might be a good place for you. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Psalms, number 49, Psalm number 49. Use the Pew Bible in front of you if you didn't bring your own today. I'd love for you to see this text. It's on page 560 in your Pew Bibles. The message is entitled, A Matter of Life and Death. And I wonder if you know what I'm going to be talking about. What's a matter of life and death? and death. Is it uh, the Super Bowl game tonight? Could, could that be it? Or the Keystone Pipeline vote in the Senate? Could that be it? No, important things maybe, but not life or death. When I do premarital counseling, as I was doing some this week, I encourage couples when they're on the verge of an argument to ask themselves this question, what will this matter a hundred years from now, or ten years from now, will this thing we are so upset about, will even, we even remember it a year from now? And if not, then maybe it's not that important. Certainly not a matter of life and death. Well, the psalmist is going to answer it for us, and I wonder if you'll see it as we move through it. I want to read the entire psalm and then talk with you about it. And on the back of your order of worship insert, there's a blank a space there, and you might want to jot a few things down. Chapter 49, verse 1. And notice that this is addressed to everybody. So I know there are people watching, and some here in this room, you're not particularly religious people, and maybe you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. You're here for any number of reasons, and I'm so glad you are. But notice that this psalm is directed to everybody in the world, regardless of any of that. Hear this, all you peoples, listen, all who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The utterance from my heart will give understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With the harp, I will expound my riddle. Why should I fear when evil days come, when the wicked deceivers surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches? No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that the wise men die, the foolish and the senseless alike perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. But man, despite his riches, does not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. Like sheep, they are destined for the grave, and death will feed on them. The upright will rule over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from their princely mansions. But God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. Do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. Though while he lived, he counted himself blessed, and men praise you when you prosper, he will join the generations of his fathers who will never see the light of life. And here he repeats the chorus from verse 12. Verse 20, a man who has riches without understanding is like the beasts that perish. What is a matter of life and death? Life and death. Those two issues. And I'm wondering today, have you developed in your life, religious or not, have you developed in your life a philosophy of life and death? How do you approach it? You've thought about it. Have you organized those thoughts in your mind? Do you have a coherent philosophy? That's what the writer of this psalm is leading us to, and I hope you will have one before we are finished today. Now, normally we would start with life, because that comes first. Life, and then we move to death. But I want us to start with death. 
Because I don't think you're really prepared to live until you're prepared to die. You can't really enjoy life until you have confronted the reality of death. So let's start there. And the first thing that I see in this psalm is we're all going to die. Ever, could it be clearer than that? All of us are going to die. Nobody gets out of this life alive. Look at verse 10. For all can see that the wise men die, the foolish and the senseless alike perish. Everybody dies. Just like animals, we, we come to the end of our life, we're put in a grave, decay happens, everybody dies. C.S. Lewis once wrote, wars do not increase the death rate. The death rate in every generation is always the same, 100%. And statistics bear this out. One out of every one persons dies. The writer of Hebrews put it this way, there is appointed unto every person once to die. You don't like to think about it. You, you push the idea away, but the fact is you have an appointment with death. It's on God's calendar. There's no getting around it. But the second thing I want you to see is when you die, you leave everything. You can't take it with you. No matter what you have in this life, when you come to that moment of death, you go out just the way you came in, naked and without anything. You must leave, first of all, your riches behind. Again, verse 10, for all can see that wise men die, the foolish and the senseless alike, and they leave their wealth to others. Look at verse 17, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. You can't take it with you. Now, I hope you have enough to be comfortable with. The, the newspaper said this week, if you live in D.C., that, that's over $100,000 you need to make every year just to be happy and just to have the kind of life anybody would want to have. That's pretty high, isn't it? I hope you have it. Be great if you're wealthy. But what the writer is reminding us is that when you come to die, all of that is left behind. You can't take it with you. Even in this life, moth and rust might get it. Thieves might break through and steal it. But it is certain that you cannot take it with you. But it's not just your riches. You can't even take your reputation with you. It's going to die eventually as well. Look at what he says in verse 11. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. These are people that are very prominent, and they've got their names on lands. A park is named after them. They've got their name on buildings. But eventually they are forgotten by history. Maybe you work in the Longworth building. Do you know who Nicholas Longworth was? You ever heard about him? Maybe you work in the Cannon building over on Capitol Hill. Do you know who Joe Cannon was? Any idea? And you take your children to the Beatley Library here in Alexandria. Do you know who Charles Beatley was? He was the mayor of Alexandria two different times, the last one in the 1980s. Names are on the buildings, but people so quickly forget who they were. Turn over to Ecclesiastes, just a few pages over. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And Ecclesiastes is a pretty negative book. It, it reminds us that there's not much meaning in life itself, and you have to get to the very end to make sense of it. But look at chapter 1, verse 11. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. And look over at chapter 2, verse 16. For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. When we were in Austria, we visited an old, old church. Our friend took us there. I love old buildings. And this particular church on a mountainside must have been 500 years old. And we walked through it. And then we walked through the ancient cemetery that surrounded the church. And I was amazed that though the building was over 500 years old, the graves 
were all from the 20th century. And I asked my friend about that. Is that as long as this cemetery has been here? She said, no, the cemetery's been here as long as the church. But in Austria, you rent your cemetery plot. You don't buy it. And so you have it, and you're buried, and then your children come and lay flowers. Your grandchildren come. Maybe a great-grandchild will come, but eventually your name will pass from remembrance. You won't, your family won't pay the rent, and so somebody else will be buried in that same spot. You can't take it with you. We're all going to die, and we can't take anything with us when we go. You can't even buy eternity. You can't earn it. You can't pay money to get you into the next life. Now, there is a next life. How are you going to get there? You can't do anything to get it for yourself. Look at what the text says in verse 7. No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. It just can't be done. I wanted to start with death because you've got to understand you're going to die, and when you die, you're going to leave everything, and there's nothing you can do to earn a place in whatever the afterlife is. Now, if you will agree to that, that brings us to life. What are the implications then for life? Well, verse 12 tells us, no man endures. And that reminds me that life itself is very, very short. Ralph Sockman said, time is the deposit each of us has in the bank of God, and no one knows the balance until the note falls due. Think about it that way. The days of your life, the time of your life, is like a bank account with God, and you don't know what the balance is. You check your balance sometimes before you write a big check, before you buy something. You check the balance to see how much there is. Well, your, your deposit in the bank of God is time, but you have no idea how much time is left. Time is short. Every year, you pass the date that will eventually be on your tombstone. Today is February the 1st. Could that be on your tombstone one day? Every year we pass it. We have a short time to live. And if that's true, and we can't take anything with us, then we should not be overly impressed with wealth and celebrity. Now, I know we are. We, we're impressed with those who have a lot of money. We, we are impressed with celebrities. We watch entertainment tonight. We buy People magazine. We want to know what the beautiful people are doing. We want to wear our hair the way they do, the fashions they wear. We're impressed. But look at what the psalmist says in chapter 49, verse 16. Do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. Louis XIV died in 1715 at age 77. He had been the king of France for 72 years, the longest reign of any monarch in Europe. He ascended the throne when he was five. He called himself Louis the Great. On one occasion, he said, I am the state. His court was magnificent, filled with splendor. When he died, his funeral was in a vast cathedral in Paris, and all the lights were dimmed except for one candle, which was just above his golden coffin. And there he was laying. Bishop Massillon was called upon to give the funeral oration. He was the preacher of his day. And when it came his moment, he ascended the pulpit and stood over the casket. We don't know what he said in his entire sermon. We just know his first line. He looked out at the people and he said, Only God is great. And he reached down and snuffed out the candle. 
a good reminder for you and for me too. Only God is great. We're all going to die. We're all going to leave everything. And so that makes me ask you the question, since you don't know how much time you have, you're young, so you think, well, I've got a lot of time. No, young people die too. If you're middle-aged, well, I've got 20 more years, 30 more years. No, you don't know that. Everyone's going to die. So if that's true, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing the rest of your life? Are you going to waste it when there might be so little of it? And if you're going to leave all your wealth behind, then what are you doing with the wealth that you have? Whether it's a little or a lot, what are you doing? If you can't take it with you, why not invest it in something that is eternal? Something that's going to last beyond your years, like the kingdom of God. Something that will still be reaching souls and developing Christians for generations and generations to come. That's what you do with your wealth. You don't just amass it for yourself. You're going to leave it all one day. Life is short. Don't be impressed with the wealthy or the celebrities. But do this. Seek wisdom and understanding. If there's something to pursue, let it be that, wisdom and understanding. Look at the last verse again. A man who has riches without understanding is like the beasts that perish. Are you going to die just like an animal? Not if you have wisdom. Not if you seek understanding. We've all seen those cartoons of, uh, of people looking for the meaning of life, and they, they climb the mountains in India somewhere, and there's a holy man squatting there on the top of the mountain, and the, the person finally reaches the top, and he asks, what is the meaning of life? I, I saw one cartoon this week. What is the meaning of life? And the holy man said, the meaning of life is don't ask, don't tell. So I guess we both just blew it, didn't we? Yeah, that's not where you find wisdom. A holy man atop a mountain isn't going to tell you. The Bible tells you. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Being in awe of God, being in the presence of God, seeking his face. Now, I realize this is all pretty depressing if you think about it, and I hope you are thinking about it. Life is brief and uncertain. Death is sure and coming, and we leave it all behind. Is there any word of hope here? The psalmist says nobody can earn their way into heaven. Nobody can pay the ransom. So where is the hope? Well, there is a word, just one line. I want you to see it. 49 verse 16. Verse 15, rather. But, and when you see a but, something's about to happen. Good news or bad news? This is good news. But God will redeem my life from the grave. I can't do it, but God can. God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. This is a mountaintop of hope in the Old Testament. There's not a lot of hope given. There's not a lot about heaven and how to get there in the Old Testament. But here's a glimpse of it. You can't earn it, but God will provide a way for it. So we talk about life and then death, but then there's life again. In the New Testament, it's a lot clearer. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You can't pay the ransom, but Jesus came to pay it for you. By his death on the cross, he purchased our salvation. He paid for our sins, and if we believe and receive, then heaven is ours. Jesus said in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again 
to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We get to go where Jesus is. Where he is right now is where one day we get to go because the ransom has been paid. That's the good news of the gospel. Not everybody knows this. I want to make sure it's part of your philosophy of death and life and life again. It's found in Christ. Let me show you one more passage. Turn to Romans and chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. A writer I enjoy reading says that in this matter of life, grace always bats last. God always offers us his grace, no matter what we've experienced and done in life. And here's where it's found. Chapter 10, verse 5. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or, Who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. In other words, don't, don't wonder, Who's going to go to heaven after all? Or, Who's going to hell? The answer is right here. What does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Look down at verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Christ paid the ransom. How do you receive it? By believing in your heart, you believe, don't you? You believe he died and rose again for you. You believe in your heart, not just your head, but your heart, where, where you trust. And with your mouth, you call upon Jesus as Lord. Whosoever will do that will be saved. A matter of life and death. We're all going to die. We're going to leave everything, and there's not a thing we can do about it. But God has done an amazing thing. And if we trust in Jesus, then heaven is ours. I want you to pray with me, would you? You bow your heads. In the first service, a young adult man came forward to present himself for membership. I'm wondering if there's anybody here in this room who's ready to do the same thing. You are a Christian. You want to be a part of a church where you can grow in your faith. Let us be that church. You're here today and you've never put your faith in Christ. You could do that right now where you sit. Believe in your heart and call upon his name. Jesus, come into my life. I give you my heart today. But you can't leave it there. After you pray, you've got to let people know. You can't be a secret disciple. So we invite you to come and let us celebrate with you baptize you in days to come. You saw three this morning being baptized. You need to be baptized if Christ is your Lord. Father, speak to every heart in life now and give courage to respond to everyone you're calling now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing, and I'll meet you right here at the front of the room.
Will you pray with me, please? Lord, this morning we give you the glory for truly great things you have done. And the greatest thing you have done, Father, is to give your only Son to die to save us all from our sin and redeem us from the grave that we all face. Thank you, Father, for that redemption, that new life in Christ that saves all who believe in you from the eternal death. Father, there's no other name but the name of Jesus that is worthy of glory, honor, and praise. And Father, we come now to give back to you a portion of our tithes and offerings because we acknowledge that everything that we have comes from you. Father, we ask that you go with us through this next week and help us always to stand up for Jesus. We thank you and we love you and we honor you. In your son's holy name we ask it, amen.